Firemon and Regmon have proven themselves as invaluable application troubleshooting tools. In fact, Microsoft product support uses these on a daily basis to diagnose a wide variety of system and application issues. The thing about Firemon and Regmon that makes them so indispensable is that they help to get to the root cause of what are often meaningless or misleading error messages or uh, dialogues that may come out of applications due to file or registry configuration issues. Filemon, as you'd guess, monitors all file system activity that's occurring on the system, and Regmon, as you'd also guess, monitors all registry-related activity going on in the system. These tools are available as a single download that work on all Windows platforms, from Windows 95 all the way through Vista, including 64-bit Windows XP for X64 and 64-bit Vista for X64. Single download. If it necessary, the download extracts a 64-bit version to run on a 64-bit platform. The tools have roughly uh, 100,000 downloads each off of SysInternals.com, making them two of the most popular tools 10 years after their initial release. That's 100,000 total? 100,000 each. Total downloads. Total downloads. A, a month. A month. Yeah. Okay. Did I specify that? Yeah. A month. The uh, manifestation of either file-related configuration issues or corrupt files or registry uh, configuration issues can be in the form of error messages, message boxes that may come up, but also application crashes, the little, we're sorry this application is closed, sorry for the inconvenience, uh, application hangs where the hourglass cursor appears, or sometimes silent process exits, process terminations that result in no visual indication. What we're also going to see is that there are a number of different root causes that can result in those kinds of behaviors. Everything from missing or corrupt files that we'd look for, for with FileMon to missing or corrupt registry data. Permissions problems on files, directories, or registry keys can cause applications to misbehave. And wrong DLL versions when they're loaded into a process can cause that process to exhibit errors. Another application of FileMon is to observe and perhaps uh, tune file system I.O. activity. By being able to get a trace of I.O. activity, it may reveal inefficient access patterns, inefficient placement of files, and uh, also explain perhaps uh, just repeated I.O. to the disk, the hard drive light is flashing, FileMon will be able to pin down who's issuing those I.O.s. Also, uh, being able to understand registry usage can help to look for configuration issues, missing registry keys, or data in the registry that's causing application failures. There are two basic techniques used for either FileMon or Regimon. One of the simplest and the one that you'll apply most often is capturing a trace of the misbehaving application or of the situation that's causing an error and working your way backwards from the end of the log file back till you find the first operation that looks like it might have triggered the kind of error behavior that you've witnessed. Another technique which is especially useful in situations where you have an application that works fine on one machine but not on another machine or under one user account but not on a different user account is to capture traces of the good and bad behavior, save them to files, and then compare them, looking for differences that could explain the misbehavior. But you'll have to do a little bit of preparatory work because if you save a file on a regimon log file, there'll be information on each line that unless you remove it will cause every record to be different. For example, there's an operation count or line number, the current date time is included in the log records, and also the process ID, which will be different from run to run. Well, it's very simple to remove this uh, data by opening the FileMon or Regimon log file with Excel. Just choose the standard text import wizard settings, click finish. It'll naturally separate the columns into separate columns, and basically you're going to delete the first three columns resave it out to disk, and then use a file comparison tool to compare the logs. So Dave, you've got a motto, don't you, when it comes to troubleshooting problems with related application behavior? Absolutely. When in doubt, run FileMon and Regmon. And I can't overemphasize that enough. I've had multiple occasions where I was sure it was a file-related issue, and it was registry. Or the reverse. I thought it was a registry issue, and it was a file issue. The other thing we'll see is that you should capture everything and then save that to a log file that you can load back and then apply filters to after you've loaded the file back into the display. If you set the filters during the capture, you could potentially exclude the relevant operations from the trace and then not be able to correctly diagnose the problem. And we're going to see later that you can set a, a trace depth so that you could leave file on a regimen running for a long period of time without worrying about uh, filling your disk or filling virtual memory. Again, save that log with all of the capture as soon as a problem occurs, and then use the filtering that we're going to see to 
weed out the unnecessary, irrelevant data to be able to focus in and get to the root cause of the problem. Before we get started looking at FileMon, we're going to talk a little bit about how it works. FileMon requires that a driver be loaded in order for it to see all file system related activity. And loading a driver is a very powerful operation. Once you have a driver loaded, you basically have full control of the machine. So the first execution of FileMon on any system requires that the account launching FileMon have what's called the load driver user right, which you can manage through the user rights manager in Windows. After the driver is loaded, though, FileMon's driver enforces a level of security to prevent a uh, low rights user from manipulating the FileMon driver and controlling and this important or critical kernel mode code. So after its initial execution, after the driver is loaded, it requires that the FileMon executable that might be subsequently launched have the debug program's user right. And the debug program's user right is, uh, again, another very powerful privilege that would typically is used to give application developers the ability to open any other process on the system, ones running in different accounts, in order to debug them. And that's a privilege mark, if I'm right. It's, it is granted by default to an administrator. It's a little bit misnamed because it is not needed to actually debug a process. Right. The processes running in the user's own account, they can always debug. And uh, this is a good check that you have in the driver because otherwise on a terminal server, if an administrator ran FileMon, a non-administrator, if this driver didn't make this uh, check, could run FileMon and get a trace of I.O. activity and see names of files and folders that they didn't have the right to see. So, that's, so FileMon does really require that the user have basically administrator level rights. Now let's take a look at the basic output that FileMon produces and talk about the columns. So I'm going to go to the Start menu, bring up FileMon. We have a shortcut on the Start menu for it. Uh, the driver was loaded if it wasn't already loaded. Immediately FileMon begins by capturing all file, o, all file activity by default. We're going to see later how to customize that. Now if you look at the first column, that's the operation count or line number that is increasing one by one. Uh, the next column is obviously the date time of the capture record. The process, the image name is shown along with the process ID after the colon. We have the request, which could be, as we see here, close, open. We might see reads and writes, uh, query information. The path to where the I.O. operation is directed, that could be a file or it also could be a folder. In this case, we see a file being accessed repeatedly. The result of the operation, success, we might see access denied, uh, end of file, and then the all-important other column. The other column is important because it adds details about the I.O. operation that may explain uh, why an operation is failing. For example, accessing a file as a directory or as a file. You'll see in the other column the length of a read or a query operation. So, Details about the actual I.O. request are in the other column and may be essential to understanding the root cause for some I.O. related error. The way that Dave stopped the capture right there, uh, when you didn't see him manipulating any menu item or toolbar button, was to type Control E, which start is used both to stop logging and to restart login. And you can get to those from, through toolbar buttons or through the menu. Another option which is useful is clearing the display. So if uh, you want to reset the display, to capture a new trace, uh, what I just did is type Control X, which is the accelerator, or you could come up to this eraser and press that, or again, get it, get at that option through a menu item. If you've got a trace and you're looking for uh, access to a particular registry key or a particular error message, you can search for it using the Find feature. So I'm going to restart the trace, capture some data, and we're going to show the, the Find feature. And here we see a lot of repetitious activity. Uh, so when I do a search, we're going to basically find the next item in the selection. So the search starts at where you select F3. Let's search again for the next item. So what I just uh, did is search for query info. And there's a, a number of those in this particular trace. If you come across a line and want to go examine the contents of the folder in which the file referenced are located or the directory if it's a reference to a directory, simply click on the line in the display and you'll be taken to the parent directory if it's a file or that particular directory if the reference is a directory. And finally, if you want to save a trace for later to reload back into FileMon or to send somebody else, you can do that with the File Save As menu or toolbar button here. Save it to a text file. It's going to be a tab-delimited text file. 
that you can then import into an uh, application like Excel, for example, and perform various operations on. Now, we saw when I first ran Filemon that it immediately began tracing IO activity. So what does Filemon trace by default? Well, it traces accesses to all local non-removable media, as well as access to network uh, file systems, whether it be a map drive letter or a UNC path name. Now, if we go back to Filemon and go to the Volumes menu, you can configure this. For example, you could turn off network tracing by deselecting network. We could enable uh, tracing of uh, IOs to the CD-ROM or to other removable media, like iColon happens to be an uh, external hard drive connected via the USB port. The other uh, option in the Filemon configuration that if you're going to leave Filemon running for a long period of time is the history depth. So if we go to the options menu and choose history depth, we can see that the default history depth is zero, which means an infinite number of records. If you're going to leave Filemon or Regmon running for a long period of time, you want to set the history depth to some fixed value, for example, 10,000 or 20,000, because the Filemon records are stored inside the private address space of Filemon. If left unchecked, it would consume all of the virtual memory on the system or fail because it exceeded its per-process virtual memory limit. So in one example where I had a user that had an intermittent problem, we ran Filemon, we set the history depth to 10,000, minimized the window, told the user that when the problem occurred to please call technical support, and then we went over to the workstation, brought Filemon to the foreground, stopped the capture, saved the log file, and then we're able to go process that offline. One of the problems you'll encounter when you run Filemon is that it tends to capture a lot of activity that's not relevant to the particular problem you're trying to diagnose. So Filemon has a filtering capability that you get to with this filter toolbar button, opening the filter dialog box, that allows you to specify include, exclude, and highlight filters, and also to set filters on what type of operation you want to capture. So let's talk a little bit about each of these. The include filter you'd use to specify what kind of string match you want against the process column, the path column, or the result column. So what I'm going to do is launch Notepad, and we're going to only see activity from Notepad itself show up. And we'll also see references to Notepad.exe from other applications. If they happen to look at Notepad's image, this MSMPEng.exe happens to be the Microsoft Windows Defender executable image, which describes itself as service executable. You can see it's in the Windows Defender directory here. And that is looking at notepad.exe's image, probably to see if it uh, happens to be a virus or not. So the filter can, this include filter can zoom in on exactly what you're interested in. However, sometimes it's more useful to exclude things rather than include things. For instance, if you have some particular process that's always performing activity on your system and you know that it's not related to the problem you're seeing, you might want to enter its name. So for instance, explore.exe, you might want to exclude since it's going to be performing operations in the background and when you launch applications that might not be interesting. And then finally, the highlight filter is useful for calling out accesses to files or directories or accesses by processes that are relevant or interesting to your particular oper uh, diagnosing. So I'm going to enter a filter for notepad.exe. Any line that has notepad.exe anywhere in it, which happens to be everything because that's what my include filter was set to, is going to show up in red. And of course, this is more useful if you're typing something that's more exclusive and shows up only in a few of the output lines. When, if you want to ever reset the filters, the default menu button will get you, the default button will get you back to the default settings. And finally, this checkbox is down here at the bottom. The log opens, the log reads, the log writes, log successes and log errors are useful for tracking down, for instance, errors related to modifications to files, where you would uncheck the log open and log read buttons, or errors themselves. If you only wanted to see operations that had error codes, you would uncheck the log successes. I want to mention, Mark, that I've been bit multiple times by setting a restrictive include filter that did eliminate the uh, file-related records that I was interested in. I've also had the case where I accidentally set the include filter to nothing, which if you do that now, we'll see what happens to the display. Everything's eliminated because we said include nothing. So Filemon will happily obey your uh, every request, even if it may result in no capture or missing the capture you're interested in. Now, I mentioned that Filemon can be a useful tool to understand hard disk activity. 
And this is important because the built-in operating system performance counters do give you a total of the number of IOs by process. You can have read operations and write operations by process. Also system-wide, there's uh, counters for system-wide reads and writes and file control operations. Also you can look at those counters on a per disk basis. But what those don't show is which process is issuing, uh, to which file are these IOs directed. So Philemon pinpoints who, what, and how. How was the file accessed? What part of the file was accessed? Who was accessing it? And what files were being accessed? So when you run Philemon, one of the things that you might see is repetitious queries of the same locations. And that's, this is a behavior called polling, where an application is interested in a change to a file or directory and will once every second, once every five seconds, or ten seconds, go look to see if that file or directory's contents have changed. Philemon should actually be idle on an idle system. And when we brought up Philemon to show it, we noticed that explorer.exe is periodically querying the status of this particular executable on disk. If you took the time to ex investigate the root cause of this polling behavior that Explorer is exhibiting, you would find that it's related to the changing appearance of a tray icon. Whenever a tray icon updates itself, Explorer goes and has to query the image file to pull out the updated bitmap. And so that would explain that kind of behavior. There's really nothing Explorer can do about this. So this isn't something that you'd consider uh, poor polling, but many applications, unfortunately, including some that uh, you might have running across your entire enterprise, such as an antivirus or anti-spyware solution, can exhibit polling. And polling is uh, bad from a performance point of view because every time the process wakes up to perform one of these file system activities, the system scheduler has to switch to that particular process, which is a very heavyweight operation. It basically uh, eliminates any information in the local CPU cache that's relevant to whatever was happening before. It soaks up CPU cycles. It causes the memory manager to have to keep that process, parts of that process in memory at all times. And of course, it's related, uh, showing you uh, file system activity, so I.O. activity, which is soaking up C CPU cycles and maybe disk activity. So polling is bad. If you see it, contact the vendor or see if you can figure out a, if you can get a replacement application that doesn't exhibit that behavior. Now, Filemon can also be useful for detecting inefficient I.O. patterns. Uh, a, a file, for example, that may be um, accessed in a, in a suboptimal way. And in order to demonstrate this, we're not trying to pick on Notepad, but we're going to use Notepad as an example and, and take a close look at what I.O. operations take place when you perform what you would think is a relatively simple and straightforward operation, creating a single line text file and saving it with Notepad. So to start out, we're going to run Filemon switch to Filemon. We're going to set the filter, I'm pressing Control L, to notepad.exe because we only want to capture Notepad's IOs. We're going to then run Notepad. I'm going to type some text. And then before I go to save the text, I'm going to enable the capture. Go back to Notepad. Already we saw some IOs related to Notepad. We haven't done anything yet. I'm going to do a file save as. We just did uh, several hundred more IOs just to bring up the file save as dialog. A number of DLLs were loaded. Uh, the contents of the folder that we're looking at had to be enumerated. And I'm going to save this to C colon backslash temp test 3.txt and click save. So now we're going to go back to Filemon and disable the capture. And then let's go set a highlight filter so that we can zoom in on the I.O. operations related to the text file that we saved, test3.txt. So we'll press Control L, bring up the filter highlight dialog, and under the highlight field, put test3.txt. Now we can quickly see by scrolling up and down the lines that relate to the text file that we saved. And it appears that the first reference to the file is this open operation. Now, if we look closely, this is an open operation to test3.txt, and it got a file not found. Well, we haven't saved it yet. But if we look closely at the other column, scrolling over, notice that it's an open directory. Open directory means that Notepad was attempting to open a folder called test3.txt, because there could be a folder with the same name as the file that we were creating. It wasn't there. So then, what did Notepad do next? It then attempted to open test3.txt again. Uh, was it opening as a directory? Yes. 
So Notepad wants to be really sure that test3.txt, the folder, doesn't exist, so it did it twice. Now that it knows there's no folder called test3.txt, look what it does next. It opens test3.txt, this time as a file. Again, that's clear because in the other column, we see that the option is open and not open directory. Now that Notepad is very confident that there's no file or folder called test3.txt, it considers it safe to now finally create the file test3.txt. But as soon as it creates it, it mysteriously closes it. Now that it just created the file and closed it, Notepad wants to see if it's still there. So it goes to open test3.txt. This time, it gets a success because it just created the file. And to make sure it's really there, it queries some information about the file that it had opened. It queries the basic file attributes. And then, strangely enough, Notepad deletes the file that it just created, closes the file, and now to really make sure that the file is gone from the disk, Notepad queries information about the file and gets a file not found. And then Notepad queries information about the file again to make sure that the information isn't somehow reappeared on the disk. If we scroll down a little further, Notepad, just to be 130% sure, does a directory lookup in the temp directory for a file called test3.txt, which you can see over on the right. And to no surprise, there is no such file. So when I saw this the first time, Dave, I became convinced that Notepad's actually a file system stress test utility that ships with every copy of Windows. That could be the explanation, Mark. As we continue, Notepad now opens test3.txt. Now, it just deleted the file, so how could it be success? Again, the other column is key. If you look at the other column, the option indicated is the open if. And open if means open the file if it's there, otherwise create it. So this is the second time test3.txt is being created. Now, finally, Notepad actually writes the data to the disk. And how much did it write? Again, if you look at the other column, it wrote to offset 0 for 15 bytes. 15 bytes were now written to the disk. Now, Notepad wants to inform Windows that it just wrote 15 bytes, so it sets the end of file marker to 15. And because it really wants to make sure that Windows knows this, it sets the end of file marker to 15. It then queries information about the file that it just created to make sure that everything still matches. And then, because it's getting paranoid, it does a directory lookup in the temp folder one more time to make sure that test3.txt exists. There's the reference to the file name. This time it's a success. Finally, Notepad, having exercised the file system thoroughly, can close the file and report success to the user. We've now saved the data to disk. Well, I'm exhausted just watching that data. I am too. But why is it really doing this? Is this just a bug in Notepad? I don't know, Mark, tell us. Well, actually, it's not Notepad that's performing most of those operations. The first operations where we saw Notepad create a file and then delete it are actually being performed by the Common Control dialog box, which implements a file open function that applications can call on. And file open will either return nothing or return the path of the file that the user wants to create. The common control dialog box is actually creating the file and then deleting it to make sure that it's possible to create a file at the location that user specified and handles the error itself. If it wasn't possible, it would have propped up a dialog box and told the user to specify a different path. The application developer, in this case Notepad, didn't have to worry about handling that particular error. But some of the other repetitious activities and some of the other queries, I can't really explain other than to say that the common control dialog box and Notepad were written de a decade ago. And there's lots of C++ code and lots of developers that probably had their hands in there and didn't realize that information is getting lost across various operations, and therefore they're performing them multiple times. I think one of the takeaway points here is that it could be very useful to run FileMon on your own internal applications. Just examine the I.O. access patterns, and perhaps you may see, not even being the developer of the application, something that looks obviously inefficient. For example, there was one research program that I was uh, checking the performance of, ran FileMon, it opened a very large database file, and then it read that file in one byte at a time. The file was about 10 megabytes. Well, reading a file in one byte at a time is not the most efficient way to do file I.O. I remember I showed the FileMon log to the developer, and he immediately recognized uh, or realized what was wrong and fixed it to do larger reads. Well, I was especially pleased with a similar story. I, we were up at Microsoft, and the Microsoft gaming evangelist said he'd worked with a game publisher who had a performance problem loading maps in off disk. In fact, it was a game that I play pretty frequently, and they saw in the file on trace similar activity, reading the map in one byte at a time. So they've gone and changed the game and improved the load time of those maps for my benefit indirectly.
In fact, didn't Microsoft Office Teams send you a thank you certificate for their yeah. use of FileMon? Microsoft Office has used FileMon to troubleshoot the performance or tune the performance of Microsoft Office. Now, you wouldn't necessarily believe that, but imagine how much worse it would be if they hadn't. Now, when we went through that file trace of uh, Notepad saving the file, we actually weren't even seeing all the operations because we were set to the default option in FileMon, and that is basic mode. So basic mode is omitting a lot of information and also massaging some of the names of the I.O. operations that FileMon is really seeing down in the, at the kernel level so that it's more intuitive to somebody troubleshooting common system problems. So let me go back to FileMon and we're going to switch from basic mode to advanced mode. I'm going to clear the display, go to options, advanced output, and let me reset the filter so we get some activity captured. And now the requests look much different than they did before. They look uh, a little bit cryptic. So instead of saying open and close, we see ERP MJ create, ERP MJ cleanup, and ERP MJ close. These are the inter internal I.O. operations that actually map back to those friendly names that FileMon would show in basic mode. But some of the other things that you don't see when you're in basic mode are activity from the system process. And activity from the system process would include file-related operations from system threads, NTFS itself performs operations from the system process. Paging I.O. activity, so I.O.s that go to the paging file, FileMon's going to emit, typically not useful for troubleshooting. FileMon's own file system activity, it emits from the trace. So a bunch of information is not shown. You should be aware that advanced mode exists in case maybe you feel that you need to have access to that kind of information or want to see actually the internal gory details of the file-related I.O.s. Let's look at a number of real-world case studies, examples where FileMon was used to solve real application errors, failures, or strange or misleading error messages. The first example was uh, a user that was editing a Word document using uh, the version of Word uh, called Word XP, and while typing, mysteriously, Word would disappear. The process would vaporize. It would exit without any error message. No, Dr. Watson, no, we're sorry for the inconvenience. Your process has crashed. And because it was intermittent, uh, it wasn't reproducible, we ran FileMon on the user's workstation, set the history depth to 10,000, minimized the window, and asked the user to please call tech support when the problem re reoccurred. Sure enough, the problem occurred later that day. Word disappeared. So uh, we captured the FileMon log to disk and then went and opened it. We looked backwards using the technique Mark mentioned at the last I.O. operations that Word performed and made our way backwards through the log until we found the first set of operations that didn't seem right. And in fact, that pointed us to the problem. Do you want to pull up that log file, Dave? Yeah, let's go bring FileMon up. And we're going to open the log file because we kept a copy of that. So I'm doing a file open. Now, before I do that, I'm going to check that my filter is set to the default because the FileMon filter would apply when I open the log file. Mm -hmm. I don't want to exclude any useful information. So I'm doing a file open and uh, go to the directory that has the Lex corrupt and select the FileMon log file. It's now been loaded and uh, this log file has 2,500 records in it. That's the last line number on the bottom. Now, I could work my way backwards to find WinWord, but because I knew that WinWord was the faulting application, I'm going to set the filter to include only WinWord. And one way you can do that quickly is by doing a right click on the process and say include process. That sets the FileMon filter to, that to include that process name string. So we're now eliminating everything except for the entries that apply to Word. Now, the last thing Word did was close a bunch of files. Is that a problem? No, that's normal, because when a process exits, part of the process rundown on Windows is to close all the open handles. So this is the normal sequence of events we would expect to see when a process exits. So we need to go to the first thing before the sequence of closes. And that was a read from a file in the application data Microsoft Outlook directory. Now, that could be the problem, but it's not obvious that it is, so we'll kind of put that to the side and go to the previous line. And that was a read from a file in the proofing tools directory. In fact, it was a read from the Spanish dictionary. If we go across, what's interesting about this particular read request is that it resulted in an end of file. Well, that's not that normal for a process to read beyond the end of file. 
But if we go to the previous read request, and the previous read request, and the previous read request, and the previous previous, Word was reading repeatedly, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, beyond the end of file of this Spanish dictionary file. And if we go over to the other column, we can see that it was reading repeatedly from the same location, at this large file offset with the same length. Well, that's not normal. Hundreds and hundreds of reads to an invalid file position in a file. The solution? Get a correct version of that file. That file was corrupt. And this is one of many manifestations of corrupt files. Applications that aren't prepared to deal with an invalid file format may cause the application to go into a loop or to crash. In this case, it caused a silent process crash. There was no error message. Reinstalling the proofing tools to replace the file, problem went away. An example of a problem that would literally be unsolvable without looking at the file on trace. So there's probably nothing more gratifying to me, Dave, than uh, using my own tools to troubleshoot problems that I encounter. And I had an opportunity to use FileMon to troubleshoot just such a problem. I was building a tool with uh, Visual Studio, and the linker, and, uh, when the linker went to link the tool together, came up with an error. Let's go take a look at what error it showed us. So I've got the screenshot here of the command prompt in which the linker ran, and the error basically is error writing to a database and there's the name of the executable, well, a PDB file. Let's zoom in a little bit. And the message, the message tells us to check for insufficient disk space and, or insufficient privilege. So it tells us that uh, there's a, a problem with the build, with the link step, but the linker is actually not able to tell us precisely what the problem is. And so this had me confused for a while. So my first step in the troubleshooting process was to run FileMon and capture a trace of the link process. And I have that trace saved away, so let's load that into memory. Oops, and you know what, Dave? I just had a filter set from your previous example, so let's clear that and perform that save operation, uh, that load operation again. And if we scroll over, what we're going to find is This error down here that comes out of the linker. Linker's trying to open the PDB file and getting a sharing violation. And processes get a sharing violation when they try to open a file that another process has open and open in such a way that it doesn't want to allow different processes to also access the file. So my next step was to figure out which process had this PDB file open. So I ran Process Explorer, did a handle search to find out who might have that handle to that file open. It turns out WinDebug, the Windows debugger from the Debugging Tools for Windows package, had the file open. It turns out I had just debugged a previous instance or previous build of that process using WinDebug, but closed the debug session. WinDebug had kept the handle open, so the solution in this case was to close WinDebug and have it release the handle. That was actually a bug in a particular version of the Debugging Tools for Windows package for 64-bit that they subsequently fixed after I reported this particular error. One case where FileMon was able to pinpoint the root cause for a generic error message was in the case of a, a file that was corrupt in a location that it shouldn't have been in that caused Microsoft Excel when it started to produce a generic error message unable to read file. No indication as to what file, where it was, or what the problem was. Now we have that uh, situation recreated on the laptop here, so we're going to go to the Start button, attempt to launch Excel, and sure enough it fails with this generic message unable to read file. So let's get FileMon in action. So we'll close Excel, switch over to FileMon, and I'm going to set the filter to Excel.exe. I have as the exclude filter the Microsoft anti-spyware uh, process, which I have installed in this machine. We'll start the capture by clicking the capture icon on the toolbar. And now let's go back to the Start button, try to launch Excel. We get the same error message. Switch back to FileMon, stop the capture, and using the technique that we discussed earlier, we go to the end of the log and work our way backwards to find the I.O. entry that would indicate or point to the problem. Now the last few records here are Excel shutting down, DLLs being referenced, opened and closed. Uh, to save time, we're going to go back to the root cause of the issue, and this was references to a file in the user profile's Excel start folder. 
Microsoft Office applications have a folder where they look by default for documents to load. In the case of Excel, it looks in the user profile application data, Microsoft Excel Excel start folder. And Excel was opening and reading a file in there called new text document.txt that we can see there on the right. Now I'm going to use the feature in Filemon where if I double click on this line, Filemon opens an explorer window taking me to the folder containing the file. And sure enough, there is a text file of that name, and if you'll notice, the length is zero bytes. Well, that's a file whose size Excel is not prepared to deal with. So it's the presence of this zero length file that caused Excel to fail, even though this wasn't an Excel file, it was a text file. So we'll delete the file, close Excel first, and now when we go back and restart Excel, Excel starts without errors. Problem solved, thanks to Filemon. Another type of problem Filemon can help you troubleshoot are DLL problems. DLL problems that are caused because uh, application installations become corrupt and the DLLs are missing, or because when you launch the application, it is pulling DLLs from a different location than the DLLs for which it's written are located. So with Filemon, you can get capture trace and look at the DLL loads. And this is an example where if you've got a situation where application works fine in one installation but not in another installation, capture the traces of both, strip out information that's different always in the two traces, load it into Excel as Dave is going to show you, and then compare the traces to look for the last uh, DLL open before the failure. You know, I can think of a case where I had a friend who, on a Windows 95 machine, I usually try not to do any troubleshooting on Windows 95, but he was desperate. He was trying to install a printer. And every time he tried to run the setup of the printer, it failed with some generic error message. I don't remember the details. Ran Filemon, looked at the trace of the DLLs as compared to another Windows 95 system where the printer driver was able to be installed successfully. And uh, they were identical, identical, identical until at one point on the failing system, a DLL was being loaded from the Windows temp folder. Whereas on the other system was being loaded what from was it stuff. doing in the temp folder? We never know. We never okay. found out. But we got rid of the copy in the temp folder, and the installation worked fine. Let's look at some examples. Well, here's one that without Filemon literally would have been unsolvable. The symptom was Word crashed. This happened to be Word 97. But the crash was not immediate. You would start Word, type a few characters, process would crash. Even if you didn't type any characters, after a second or so, Word would crash. So of course the user tried reinstalling Office. Problem occurred, still failed. So the solution, we ran Filemon. When Word crashed, we went to the end of the log, and we carefully examined each I.O. activity from uh, Word. And the last set of uh, I.O. operations were DLL references, DLLs that were being opened. File, uh, Filemon was capturing actually the startup of Word and loading of the initial DLLs. And Right before the I.O. records for Dr. Watson, which was reporting the process crash, the last DLL to be loaded and opened inside uh, Word was an, a printer DLL from a printer manufacturer that shall remain nameless. And then right after the DLL was loaded, then Dr. Watson came up. And the tricky part about that is the DLL load was successful. So the error was, there was no error loading the DLL, but it was the fact that the DLL loaded that caused the process to crash. And the reason for that was it turned out that the uh, printer DLL was for the wrong version of Windows. And when it loaded, when a DLL loads in a process, a small amount of code is invoked. That code ran and caused a memory access violation inside Word and caused the Word process to crash. So the solution was to uninstall the printer from the system, and the problem went away. Now here's another example that a particular user was running Perfmon. And when they launched Perfmon, Perfmon would just sit there and hang. It's not something that you might immediately think of jumping to Filemon to troubleshoot, but this user had learned from the past that Filemon can sometimes uh, reveal the cause of any kinds of problems, including these. Actually, Mark, you know when this happened? When? This was during a delivery of our class down in Orlando. So it was somebody in the class who had just learned about Filemon who then applied it for a real-world problem during the class. Well, let's talk, take a look at how they troubleshot this particular problem. They captured a Filemon trace of Perfmon starting up, and we have that ca a copy of that trace here on this system. Let's load that in. This is so exciting. Oops, and there we got bit by the filter again. We go to the end of the log file and work our way backwards. Now we're seeing activity here from other processes other than Perfmon. Explorer is opening Perfmon 4.exe. 
task managers opening perfmon 4exe because the user had pulled up task manager to help troubleshoot the problem. Here are the actual references from perfmon. And we can see that the last file that it referenced before it went dark on us is uh, DLL, w3ctrs.dll. The user wasn't sure what that DLL was for, so they looked at the Explorer file properties for that DLL and found that it was related to INET info, the IIS service. And this caused them to go and see what was going on with the IIS service. So they pulled up the IIS uh, service, control, uh, service manager, MMC snap in in Windows, and we're going to go look at the screenshot of what they saw. I'm going to scroll down here through the list of services down to the World Wide Web Publishing Service, which, which is the INET Info service. And it's got a state, a status that is different than the statuses of the other services we see in the list. The other ones are either started or not running. This one or is starting, so it's actually not even fully started up. And it turns out that Perfmon is trying to read performance counters from INET Info, the, the World Wide Web Publishing Service, which it's not responding to because it's not fully initialized. So this led the user to go look at the INET Info configuration and find that there was indeed a bug in the way that they configured it, a problem in the way they configured it. They reconfigured INET Info or IIS, restarted IIS, and Perfmon didn't hang after they made the change. In another case, FileMon solved the problem very quickly that a developer had spent several days debugging. It was a research application that worked fine when bringing up the help text on Windows 95. Uh, sorry, it worked on all the versions of Windows except Windows 95. And the problem wasn't trying to bring up the help. And when the help was brought up in Windows 95, it failed with some meaningless error message. And they had actually communicated with the vendor that wrote the help library, and they had said it wasn't their problem. So I was asked to troubleshoot the problem, and uh, I started by, of course, running FileMon on the failing system, Windows 95, and then I did a FileMon capture on Windows 98, which was the closest version of the operating system that it was working on. I did the normal log preparation, which meant opening both log files, stripping out the first three columns, saving them back to disk using Excel, and then use WinDiff to compare the logs. And even though there were two different versions of Windows, Windows 95 and Windows 98, the I.O. operations were identical for quite a while until at one point they diverged. And where they diverged, the path for one of the Olay object linking and embedding DLLs was different. On the Windows 95 system, it was coming from a network share. On the Windows 98 system, it was coming from the Windows uh, system directory. Turns out that that DLL didn't exist in Windows 95, but there was a version of that DLL in a network directory that happened to be in the user's path. So, uh, and this version of the DLL on this network directory was actually for Windows NT4. So that DLL was being loaded in the process and causing the process to crash. So the solution was to get the proper version of the DLL for Windows 95, and the problem went away. It turns out that applications pulling DLLs from places that they're, they're not configured to pull them from is not that uncommon. And we've got an example here of a corporate user that would run Access and try to import a particular Excel file into Access, and Access would hang when they tried to do that. Because it was a corporate network with similarly configured machines, they could try loading the same Excel file into Access running on different computers, and they found that it was only this one user's machine that exhibited this particular behavior. So this was a perfect opportunity to capture FileMon, a good FileMon trace and a bad FileMon trace, and then compare them. And we've got both traces, so we're going to pull those up in WinDiff. And this is the directory that the FileMon traces are in. Whoops, I'm in the wrong directory. Let me cd into the correct directory. And then we have uh, FileMon Lab 3 bad, FileMon Lab 3 good. We're going to load those into WinDiff with the bad on the left and the good on the right. And now, Dave, why don't you work with me to troubleshoot exactly what the problem is? We're, the, remember, the goal here, Dave, is to find the first significant difference between the two traces, because there can be some differences that are innocuous. So this is telling us that there's a difference between this operation on one system from this operation on the other. What, what is, is causing that difference? Let me zoom in. Yeah, that helps, Mark. Now I can see that on the failing system, which is the one in red, 
the MyDocs directory had a capital Y, whereas on the working system it had a lowercase y. There was also an additional I.O. on the failing system to F colon backslash. So I would say that difference, looking at it just at a cursory level, seems to not be relevant to the problem. Yeah, Windows doesn't care about, compare about file uh, name case, case sensitivity. How about the next one? Same thing, Mark. Case sensitivity difference. Yeah. How about this one down here? Oh, that's a little harder. Can you zoom in on that? Yeah. You know, I see that the temp files have different names, but you know what, Mark? I think temp files often do have different names on different computers, so I would say that's not a problem. Okay. How about the next one down? Oh, that's getting harder, Mark. Uh, msjtes 40dll You know, one's lowercase and one's uppercase. Again, Windows doesn't care. Okay. And the next one? Temp files. I got that one right away, Mark. Uh -huh. That's okay. Okay. Let's uh, go look a little bit further. We still haven't come across a significant difference. And uh, here we are. stdole2.tlb, same file, same path, different case, not a problem. Okay. Temp file names, not a problem. Okay. The next one, WinNT System32 ACC DLL. And on the other system, it was coming from a completely different folder. Mark, I think that's the problem. And yep, this is very similar to the example that you just talked about, where a DLL is in the System32 directory. The application expects it to find it in a different directory, and uh, it's causing it to misbehave. In this case, they found that the acwiz.dll in the system32 directory was from an older version of Access. So the solution was simply to delete that file, and Access then was happy with the Excel file that they tried to import. And I remember this particular example was interesting because it was not a crash, it was a hang of Access, just because the wrong version of the DLL got loaded, and Access, again, did not notify the user about that. A similar case, a uh, different application, but a similar case in that this is another example of an application hang that FileMom was able to solve, was starting uh, a video editing tool uh, from Pinnacle called Pinnacle Studio. The application was hanging on startup, so no window was appearing when the program was started. So again, FileMom was used to capture a file trace, and uh, let's go switch over to FileMom and load that file trace. So we'll go up to the directory that has the Pinnacle Studio hang, load the file on log file, go to the end, and work our way backwards till we see the studio.exe. And what we see is repeated references to a DLL uh, that was part of the Cyber Patrol program, which Cyber Patrol is, is a... Is that part of Pinnacle Studio? I don't think so. In fact, it was in a completely different folder. It was in the program file surf control folder. So it turns out that uh, Cyber Patrol monitors processes by loading its own DLL into each process, and it was somehow causing Pinnacle Studio to hang. Solution, uninstalled Cyber Patrol, problem in a way. Again, a problem that we could not have solved without the help of FileMon. Now, this next example is one of my favorite, Dave's, because this one involved you. And the story basically is that a friend of yours that you hadn't spoken to in some time invited you over for dinner. Isn't that right? Yeah, it had been quite a while since I had uh, been invited for dinner there, actually. And anybody, suspicious. anybody watching, this in the, watching this video uh, has probably experienced something similar. Because the profession you've got, uh, you've become the neighborhood and family computer tech support person. And this was no exception. So Dave goes over to this friend's house for dinner. They have a nice dinner, right? After dinner drink, and the guy says, Dave, while you're here, how about if you step into my study? <laughs> I've got something I'd like you to take a look at. And what he shows Dave is that he runs uh, America Online and gets this error dialog box that tells him he's, that some data file is corrupt and he's got to reinstall. So we've got a picture of that data file, the screenshot here. And uh, the error message is telling us that the main IDX file is damaged. If the problem persists, you may need to reinstall America Online software. For more information, go to keyword help in America Online. So Dave asks his friend, of course, uh, have you reinstalled America Online? And he says, yeah, in fact, we've installed it two or three times, and we decided to invite you over for dinner before we just go ahead and reinstall the whole computer. So Dave's step, of course, uh, is his advice is to capture a trace of a AOL starting up with FileMon. So they capture a trace with FileMon, which I'm going to load here into the FileMon display. And they go to the end of the log file and scroll up looking for a significant operation that might have a clue as to what the problem is. I'm going to scroll up here and up. 
file not found. That turns out that's a pretty common error message. So I'm going to whiz by that and those other related file not founds. And there we go. We see some errors start to show up. Access denied on errorlog.ini. Access denied on errorlog.ini. In fact, if we go to the top and search for access denied, denied, oops, go to the top, search down. We had the search filter set for the wrong direction. Here we go. We start, hit our first access denied on AOL.exe itself. Our next one on trayicon.ini. Our next one on main.ind and the next one on main.idx which is the name of the file that we saw in that error dialog box. So obviously what's happening here is the account in which AOL is running doesn't have the permissions AOL expects to find on those files and this was a problem with an older version of AOL that's since been fixed. Now so, I notice in the other column mark you actually report the account, the username that was uh, getting the access denied error. Right, and I think at this point you asked your friend uh, if this was his account and he told you no, this was his wife's account. It turns out he's able to run AOL fine in his account because he's running as a local administrator and that was what AOL expected to be run as. He'd removed privileges from his wife's account, afraid that his wife, I guess, would mess up the computer and when she got on it, and that caused AOL to start uh, presenting these error dialog boxes. So the fix was to loosen up, not to give his wife an administrative privilege, but to loosen up permissions on these particular files to make AOL happy. And this is a very common type of problem that you might run into with line of business apps and enterprises, applications that expect to be running as admin and that fail because they run into permissions issues. And one way to make those applications happy in a limited user environment is to go and get traces with FileMon and we'll see RegMon and find the keys and resources, directories that need to have permissions loosened up to work in that kind of environment. Another example where an application was getting an access denied error when it wasn't expecting to and reported an error message that was not related at all to the root cause was a custom application in Microsoft Outlook. Outlook was failing uh, all of a sudden. It was actually during a class. It was working fine and all of a sudden started failing with the message that we captured a copy of here. And here was the error message that appeared to a user in the middle of a class. Well, if I got this error message, message ID connect load global ISW variables ln question mark en 287, I wouldn't have a clue as to what I'd know exactly what that was. You know what that is? No, Mark? I'm just kidding. So we ran FileMon, captured a trace, and uh, we're going to take a look at a screen snapshot of the FileMon trace that pinpointed exactly what the root cause of the problem was. If you look closely at this FileMon trace, Outlook.exe was getting an error trying to create a file in a share, that was the UNC path name, and the error that it was getting, just like the previous example, access denied. And it turns out that in the course of this class, an administrator on the domain had made some changes to the rights of a folder that was in use by the students of the class, had removed the uh, complete access to that folder when instead the permissions were supposed to be adjusted to remain, uh, to leave read access. So permissions problem, again, caused application that wasn't expecting it to report a strange error message. FileMon uh, was able to get to the root cause, the permissions were fixed, and the problem was resolved. Here we have a similar problem where the Microsoft software installer, when trying to install a, an application on an end user system, would display a message about the temp folder being full or accessible. And we've got a picture of that display here, which I'm going to zoom in on. And there it is. The temp folder is on a drive that is full or inaccessible. Free up space on the drive or verify that you have write permissions on the temp folder. This user was installing the application as an administrator, which you, is the privilege you need to install most applications. And so their first step was to go and see if, in fact, their temp folder was on a drive that was full or inaccessible. They created a file in the temp directory successfully, so ruled out that as the problem. So the next step then, of course, was to run FileMon and capture a trace of the problem as it occurred. And we've got a picture of that as well. And what this shows us is the Microsoft installer service here, msiexec.exe, trying to create a file in the Windows directory under the installer subdirectory and getting an access denied. It's running actually in the local system account, which is where the installer service happens to run. And this demonstrates the problem that 
systems administrators sometimes run into when they're being overly careful with permissions. And in this situation, the IT staff had gone and reset permissions on various directories and files to remove access from any user they felt didn't need access to those resources. In this case, they removed the system accounts access to that installer directory, and that was tightening security just a little bit too tightly for Windows to work normally. They saw the access denied, loosened the permissions, and were able to get the installer to work again. And Mark, the thing that's interesting about this is, again, that message box said that the problem was with the temp folder. In fact, when you look at the file on trace, the problem was with the Win Windows installer subfolder under the WinNT directory, nothing to do with the temp folder. It was a temporary directory that the installer creates, but not a folder called temp. So again, FileMon, looking at the low-level I.O. activity, was able to reveal what the root cause was. Now, not that we like to pick on Notepad, but let's uh, bring Notepad back as an example one more time, just to show how these kind of permission problems uh, can result in spurious error messages. And we're going to try to save a text file into a folder for which we don't have any rights. So if you want to reproduce this at home, create a folder, remove all rights to the folder. We have such a folder on the root of the C drive here, so let's go over to C colon. There's a folder called test. If I double click on test, we get an access denied message. So in fact, even though we're the administrator, we've removed all permissions from this folder and uh, have no rights to access the folder. Now let's bring up a copy of Notepad, type some text, and do a file, save as, and I'm going to try to explicitly put it into C colon test, and I'll call it test.txt. Notepad reports the error. The path does not exist. Verify the correct path was given. Well, we already showed you that the path does exist. In fact, Notepad is reporting a different error than the root cause, which of course has to be a permissions issue. Let's prove that by getting a file trace with, uh, with FileMon. So I'm going to go over to FileMon. Let's set the filter to notepad.exe. Start the capture. Go back to our Notepad window and reattempt the file save. File save as c colon test test.txt. We get the path not found error. Go back to FileMon, stop the capture, go to the end of the log, and sure enough, there's the access denied trying to open the folder C colon test. But that's not what FileMon reported. FileMon reported the error message after that, and that was an attempt to open test.txt the directory. We can see that it's referencing that as a directory because of the other column, the options. It was reporting the second message as path not found when in fact the real problem was that the folder that it was trying to open the folder in was not accessible. Again, looking at the file on trace uh, reveals the access denied. This has happened so many times that when I'm trying to troubleshoot a, a spurious uh, file system related error, before I attempt to analyze the file on log, I'll actually go to the top of the log, do a search for access denied just to eliminate permissions issues, and then I'll start from the bottom and work my way backwards because it's happened so often. One very common application troubleshooting issue is dealing with missing or corrupt registry text, uh, or perhaps security settings on registry keys that uh, make registry data inaccessible to an application. That can result in application crashes or error messages that may come up that in, off, uh, in many cases are difficult to connect to the root cause. Uh, sometimes the registry is left in an inconsistent state, perhaps an uninstall left some data in the registry, or maybe a process crash left registry data in an inconsistent or corrupt state. Regmon, one of the other key troubleshooting tools on sysinternals.com, uh, often is going to yield the root cause by getting a trace of the registry I.O. and then pointing you to what the, the root cause of the problem was. Let's talk for a minute about how Regmon works before we actually see it in action. Regmon is very similar to FileMon in that the single download image off of SysInternals runs on all versions of Windows from Windows 95 all the way through 64-bit Vista for x64. Just like FileMon, Regmon relies on a device driver. So the first time you run it on a system, it loads the appropriate device driver. And subsequently, if you run Regmon again, the driver checks for the debug privilege. So again, like FileMon, you need to generally be an administrator to run it. The driver that Regmon loads intercepts registry activity, and it uses actually one of two different drivers depending on what version of Windows you're running on. 
If you're running on any on NT all the way through Windows XP, it uses one driver that does a system call hooking to watch registry related activity. In other words, it places interception points in the kernel's map of what functions handle various operations in Mark, this case. Isn't that the very thing that you've been so outspoken about in the industry that is a bad programming technique? I have been. System call hooking is something commonly used by malware like rootkits to intercept calls and then massage their output to hide their presence. So that's the reason why I use a different driver on server 2003 and 64-bit Windows XP for x64 as well as Vista because it turns out Microsoft has implemented a supported registry callback mechanism that my driver can use and tell the registry manager, hey, I'm interested in seeing registry activity. Please call this function and let me see what's going on. And that's what Windows will do on those subsequent versions that Regmon works on. So, yeah, I don't like to use system call hooking and on newer versions of Windows, Regmon doesn't. But you basically had no choice. I basically had no choice. Okay. In fact, uh, we, Regmon was the first tool for Windows that did that. So in some sense, we are somewhat responsible for the whole system call hooking problem to begin with. Some of the information you see in Regmon include the same kinds of information we saw when we pulled up FileMon. So let me pull up Regmon by going to the Start menu, going to the System, system Internals folder, and launching Regmon. Just like for FileMon, we see a, se a sequence number, a timestamp, and I'm going to stop the output here, just like in FileMon. Close this up a little bit. We see the process performing the registry activity. We see the request type. Now here, of course, we're going to see registry request types, like opens of keys, queries of values, the path to the key or the value, the status of the value. And in the other column, what we're going to see for queries, for example, are, is the value that was queried. Also, the same thing for set operations. So if a string is being written to the registry, we're going to see the string over here. If a string is being read, we'll also see the string over here. And that can be useful for identifying misconfigured keys. Just to map that mark to FileMon, um, that's a difference because in FileMon, you never see the data being read from the file or written to the file. But in this case, Regmon is basically showing you what is coming out of the registry and or what is going back into the registry, and, and often that configuration data is what may be causing an application right. failure. There's simply too much data going in and out of files and for FileMon to be able to show that. If you've used RegEdit, you're familiar with HKEY local machine, HKEY current user, and Regmon, to save screen real estate, it uses shortcuts for those various re top-level registry keys. For example, HKEY local machine is HKEY LM, HKEY current user is HCU. Now, just like in FileMon, Regmon has similar control capabilities. You can start and stop the logging with either a toolbar icon or pre pressing Control E. You can clear the display. I'm going to go back to the Regmon window now and press Control X. That's the keyboard shortcut to clear the display. Uh, Regmon also has the same find dialog. So going back to Regmon and pressing Control F, you can then search for text within the window, up or down, match case sensitive or case insensitive. And uh, also, like in FileMon, when you can, where you double click on an I.O. entry in the FileMon trace, takes you to the folder containing the file. Let's re-enable the logging, get some capture data, stop the logging. Now notice when I select a line and double click, Regmon initiates the registry editor, RegEdit, and takes us exactly to the registry key containing the value that was being referenced, or in this case, the, the key name that was being referenced, so that you can go inspect further. So it's a jump operation by double-clicking on the line. For uh, offline analysis, Regmon, like FileMon, has the option to save the log file to disk and to also load a previously saved log file. So if we go back to Regmon, if we go to the File menu, there's a Save and Save As and an open option to reload a previously saved registry trace. One of the things you encounter with Regmon, just like you encounter with FileMon, sometimes is an explosion of information, just too much data being collected. and so. Regmon has a, the same exact ways of controlling that output that FileMon does. One way is through the history depth, which you get to in the same place. Set the history depth to anything other than zero, and it will limit the number of lines captured into the output to that number, only showing you the, mo the most recent lines of output at any point in time. The filter dialog is exactly like FileMon's filter dialog. lets you specify an include filter, an exclude filter, a highlight filter, and also limit the types of operations captured to opens, reads, writes, successes, or errors. And if you change the filters, you want them back, simply select the default button and it resets. Like in uh, 
our discussion of FileMon, it's a better practice to capture everything, save the log file to disk, and then when you're uh, ready to begin analyzing, exclude the data that you think is not related to the problem so that if you exclude too much, you can always reload the save log file. Now, when Mark started Regmon for the first time, with no filter, I'm re-enabling the trace now, we see continuous registry queries. In fact, since we started running Regmon, we've had uh, almost a thousand registry operations, over a thousand now. So this is not normal. Uh, it's not uncommon, but it shouldn't be this way. Applications should not be polling the registry regularly to look for changes. Windows provides a programming mechanism for being notified of changes to registry keys. Unfortunately, many applications don't use that and instead periodically open registry keys, look for the existence of values, or reread a value to see if it's changed. We do see an example of this on this system right now. I'm going to stop the log and just take a little closer look. Now, this is a process that we've inspected a little bit before. Let's bring up the process properties. We can see that the company name is Jira Systems. It's a support application related to the modem. It's uh, in the C Windows directory, and uh, that is a process currently running on the system. If we look at the sequence of operations here, it's opening a registry key, uh, looking for the existence of a sub-key that's not there, opening the key again, looking for a value, closing the key, opening a non-existent key, opening a key successfully, querying for a different value, closing the key. Well, actually, Dave, I think if you noticed uh, one of those paths uh, there is WOW 64-32 node. Do you, can you tell us what that's all about? Well, because this is a 32-bit program running on 64-bit windows, by default, 32-bit applications that query the registry have their registry references to HQ local machine software redirected first to a subkey called WOW 6432 node. So the initial reference to the key Ajir soft modem under HQ local machine software is actually being redirected to the 32-bit specific part of the registry. So it's Windows doing that underneath, right. not Ajir. So, but the query value. Uh -huh. Uh, that we see repeatedly happening over and over again. That's coming from the soft modem uh, applet. And it's looking it repeatedly like two for two different values. Uh, presumably, if those registry values appeared, it would cause the application to perform some other operation. So it's significant that it's uh, looking for these keys, these values, but instead it should be using the regi registry change notification to avoid the polling. Now, one of the techniques that's extremely useful for troubleshooting registry-related problems is not to identify the problematic key or value and simply delete it because you might have misidentified the problem and end up in the process of trying to troubleshoot the situation, make it worse by corrupting the installation or corrupting part of Windows. So if you suspect that uh, registry data is rel related to the problematic behavior that you're witnessing, don't delete the key, simply rename it and then rerun the application. Even if the application depends on those values or those keys that you've renamed, uh, what we're going to see is a lot of applications fall back on defa default values if they can't find values in the registry. And so they'll simply recreate them and run find kind of in a reinitialized state, which can cause the problem to go away. Now we can see an example of this by using Notepad. We're going to run Notepad and change the font setting, and then we'll see using Regmon where Notepad stores those settings and what the re, uh, resulting behavior is when we delete that registry key. So let's first go over to Regmon. I'm going to set a filter to be notepad.exe. Uh, turn on the capture. Start Notepad. Go to the Format Font dialog and we'll change the font from Arial to, how about, Forte. I've never seen Forte. Let's see what it looks like. It's kind of a nice looking font. Shall we type some text? Wow. wow that's really pretty. I, I think, think I'm going to switch to that. I think it's a good one, yeah. Now, let's go back to Regmon, and uh, I'm going to do a, go to the top of the log and do a search for Forte. Hmm, it's not there yet. And that's because Notepad, unlike some applications, doesn't store the registry settings until the process exits. Some applications make a change in the registry when you make a setting change. Some wait until the process exits. So let's go back to Notepad, exit. We won't save the file changes. But now when I go and do a find for Forte, here it is. We see that Notepad did a set value. It wrote a value to the registry. And the value name was called IF 
face name. I think that's LF. LF. Yep, logical font. Thank you. And the value that it wrote was Forte. So we can see again the other column in the case of reads and writes to values uh, shows the actual data read or written. So that was the save of that uh, setting. Now, by the way, if you look at this whole sequence of set values here, it looks like when Notepad exits, it saves all of its settings to the registry, not just the ones that you change. So every time you exit Notepad, it saves all of the configuration changes to the registry. Now I'm going to use the jump feature where I double click on this uh, set value line, which brings up the registry editor positioned exactly right on the registry value that was uh, being referenced. And since we're now open to the key Notepad underneath, if we look on the very bottom of the screen, it's underneath HP current user, Software Microsoft Notepad. Makes sense that it's part of my user profile. Let's delete that key, rerun Notepad, and see that Notepad goes back to the default settings. So is it all right, Mark, if I delete the Notepad settings? Do you um, have any? I'm trusting you here because I really like those settings that I left it with. Okay, so we're going to delete that key, and now we're going to run Notepad again. I hope Notepad's not broken. Ah. Notepad comes up, but we're back to uh, the default font, which in this case is Lucida console. So would you like mm -hmm. to go back to the Forte font, Mike? Sure. Okay. There you go. Thank now, you. Is it all set? I'm happy with that. It's not set, Mark. Oh, you need to exit it. Right. So okay. now, now it's set in the registry. Let's take a look at some real life uh, case studies, uh, examples where Regmon was used in real world uh, scenarios to troubleshoot application failures. And the first one was one that's near and dear to my heart because it actually came from my stepmother. Uh, I was teaching a class in England to a computer company and uh, in the middle of the afternoon received a message passed in from the secretary to the engineering manager and it said, uh, your dad called, uh, please call home when class is over, it's not, an, it's not an emergency. Well, I've been doing training now for 15 years and have never received a message while teaching a class. So of course, all I could think of was that there was some serious family emergency. So I finished class, went back to my uh, hotel room and uh, called uh, home. And the emergency was that um, my stepmother uh, was urgently trying to print a document for a thesis paper she was writing. And somehow, uh, all of the menus and toolbars had disappeared from Word. So she would open a Word document, and all she saw was the document, full screen mode, uh, no option to print. So first, my first thought was that the toolbar was floating somewhere. She had disconnected it, and it was floating on the screen. So I asked her if she saw any floating toolbars, and she said, floating what? Well, then I realized I wasn't going to solve this without actually seeing her screen. So I was dialing uh, using a calling card at a reasonable rate, but I now needed to dial up the Internet so that we could connect using remote assistance so that I could see her screen, which meant I had to call her back on my cell phone, which at the time was costing me about $2 a minute. So. I connected with remote assistance, and uh, sure enough, when I brought up Word, all I saw was a document. To this date, we don't know how she actually got Word into this state. So we challenge you to, to go and try to reproduce this problem yourself. But with the uh, funds disappearing at a rate of $2 a minute, I didn't want to waste time trying to isolate exactly what was wrong with Word's settings. And because I didn't even want to take the time to run RegEdit and go looking around for Word settings, I quickly ran Regmon, started Word, went back to the Regmon display, saw immediately where the queries were going to from Word startup, double-clicked on that line, which brought up RegEdit, went immediately to the key containing the Word user settings in HC Current User, deleted that key, re-ran Word, and all the toolbars and menu items were reset, and she was able to print the document. Only cost me about 50 bucks. Did you charge it back to your mom? Uh, no. I, it, was it, gift, yeah, it was a gift. It was a gift. That's nice of you. So here's another error that was solved with Regmon. In a corporate environment on one particular user's computer, they would get an error from every time they launched IE that said, cannot load the Internet Configuration Library. We've got a picture of that error dialog box. So there's the message about it not being able to load icfgnt.dll. And its recommendation is, uh, well, it says the following error occurred. The specified module cannot be found. So that implies that the DLL is missing. And so, of course, the tech support person, when they got to the user's machine, went and looked for that particular DLL on that user's machine. And it wasn't there. So they went to the other machines in the network, which were similarly configured, and found that that DLL was missing from those machines as well. 
So this presented a little bit of a puzzle. They ran Regmon and captured a trace, and we're going to pull up that trace here in Regmon. So I'm going to reset the filter, stop the capture, and go and find that particular error and go to the end of the log and work our way backward looking for what might be the problem. And if we look up a little bit, we're going to see uh, there we go. A particular line, H key current reference to let me zoom in here. HK current user, software, Microsoft, Internet Connection Wizard, completed. If we look at the value, it's set to zero. That's what I, Internet Explorer read out of there. So they captured a trace of Regmon on, of IE starting up on the other machines and compared it to this one to see what the completed value was and found that on the other machines in the network, that value was set to one. How it got set to zero on this particular user machine is one of those mysteries that makes tech support so interesting. What they decided to do, rather than go reinstall the machine, was simply to open up RegEdit by double-clicking on that line and setting the value to 1, restarting IE to see if it would work, and sure enough, IE was happy and stopped presenting that dialog box. Another uh, IE-related configuration error that was a source of frustration to a user to the point where he was ready to completely scratch his hard drive and reinstall Windows. The symptom was that when starting Internet Explorer, it would hang unless the user manually dialed the internet provider. This was using a dial-up provider. So if the user dialed the internet provider first and then ran IE, it worked. However, if they just ran IE and tried to go to a website, IE would hang. So uh, before the user reinstalled Windows, I asked to just have a crack at it. So I went to uh, the user's machine, uh, ran Regmon, captured a trace, and again, using the technique we described, went to the last operations that Internet Explorer performed in the registry and work my way backwards. And the last several references to the registry were under the RAS, Remote Access Services, phone book key. And there was a reference to a subkey, ATT, which was uh, a previous uh, internet provider that had been used on that machine but was no longer being used. In fact, it had been uninstalled. Apparently, that internet provider's dialer had left some junk in the registry that was causing the auto connect support in IE to hang or choke. Solution was to delete the key, and uh, or we renamed the key actually, just in case that key was still of interest. Reran Internet Explorer, problem went away. User was very happy. Again, Regmon saves the day. Now here's another example that has a slightly different root cause than the ones we've looked at. When the end user on one particular machine installed an application, they would get an error dialog box from VBA saying error accessing the system registry. Let's go take a look at that error dialog box. That's a really uh, descriptive yeah, error. Really descriptive. There, Mark. Yeah. yeah, not much to not much of a hint about what might the, the problem be. So of course they tech support comes in, runs Regmon. Let's go pull up that Regmon log. work our way to the end and go backwards looking for something that stands out as abnormal behavior or an ab abnormal error message and of course we run into something right here in access denied on a particular registry value in hkey classes root which is uh, type lib which is where com associations are stored as well as visual basic automation information is stored and it's regserv32 so regserv32 is the program that's used to register COM DLLs. This particular COM DLL apparently wanted to, uh, let's see what it wanted to do, it wanted to set a value in there and it failed. And that's because of course the permissions on that registry key were set in such a way that this particular user was didn't have permissions to write there. So the solution was to change the permissions to allow that application to install. Again, changing something, an uh, error dialog box that gives you no hint, looking under the hood and seeing the root cause of the problem, in this case, a permissions problem. And this, just like when we looked at permissions issues uh, in relation to I.O. errors, most applications just aren't set up to recover from those gracefully. So as more and more people are interested to run under limited user context, uh, permissions errors may arise, accessing files or registry keys. So 
Uh, like with Filemon, I'll often, in the Regmon trace, first do a search for access denied before I attempt to analyze the uh, trace. And then, if there is an access denied error, that's probably the root cause mm -hmm. of the problem. And just let me point out that we saw ACK denied there instead of access denied. That was an older version of Regmon that had slightly different representations for errors. The newer ones would say access denied. Now, we've been looking at registry queries, uh, accesses to registry keys that are there. But sometimes it's more interesting to look at what is not there. Uh, for example, if we go back to the Regmon trace that we were just looking at and look at the result column, there are references to registry keys and registry values that have the result not found. What does not found mean? It means that that particular key or value doesn't exist at the time. And that's not necessarily an error. It could just be that their configuration setting has not been made. And it's, you're going to see not founds all over the place as applications start. They look for settings that have not, been yet, that have not yet been initialized. Uh, sometimes looking at the not founds may reveal hidden capabilities, registry values or registry keys that, if they were present, would enable some kind of debugging feature or tracing feature or some other option. So uh, not so much maybe for troubleshooting a problem, but just to explore capabilities in an application, it's interesting just to look through the not found errors that might come up as an application starts up that you support. And I know this one's near and dear to your heart, Dave, because this got you out of a real jam, didn't it? Regmon saved my life in this case, Mark. Dave was asked to come down and teach a class at Compaq Corporation, no longer exists, on Windows kernel troubleshooting for their top tier troubleshooting engineers. It turns out that they developed an application in-house that showed them different kinds of information about the kernel not visible with any other tool. And they thought it would be useful if Dave coming down in the context of teaching Windows internals would also demonstrate the use of that tool throughout the class. So a few weeks before he was due to deliver the class, they sent him an email with instructions on how to get the tool and install it, uh, along with the user manual, expecting that Dave would spend some time to familiarize himself with it. Of course, uh, Dave waits till the plane ride down the night before the class is supposed to start to Houston to actually open up the application to install it and see what it does. Unfortunately, he was greeted with a disturbing error. And that disturbing error looked like this, which caused Dave's heart to stop. A severe error from the installer. Compact Smart Scope can only be installed on Compact hardware. Dave was running a Toshiba laptop at the time, and it, which explained this uh, error message. So Dave starts panicking. He starts sweating. He asks the flight attendant for a stiff drink. The flight attendant goes up to the galley and prepares it and comes back and sees Dave in his seat squirming and all, <laughs> all, in an, all upset and asks, Sir, uh, is there a problem? Can I help you? So Dave points at the screen at the error message, explains what's happened here and the kind of problem that he's position he's in. And the flight attendant says, well, sir, have you tried running Regmon? And it hadn't occurred to me until yeah. that point, Mark. So that's how widely used Regmon is, that yeah. even flight attendants are familiar with it. And Dave was a little embarrassed that he hadn't thought of it himself. So he captured a trace with Regmon and re saw this reference to a not found registry value. You can see iKernel.exe, which is the setup program, calling open key on HQ local machine software compact disable hardware detection, getting back a not found. So Dave thought, hmm, maybe this is my way out. If he opens up regedit, he creates a D word, figuring this thing is a Boolean, sets it to one, closes regedit, closes the installer, and re relaunches it, only to be greeted with the installer working. So Dave, in the half an hour he had left before landing, familiarize himself with the tool, shows up at the class next morning, and then presents himself as an expert at using their tool and somehow gets away with it. Procrastination works again. And that's, uh, yeah, with that kind of uh, positive reinforcement, it's no wonder you procrastinate so much. We've talked about using FileMon to troubleshoot file error errors, RegMon to troubleshoot regist registry-related errors. But in many cases, it's not clear whether it's file or registry related. Uh, sometimes both uh, are involved, or in many cases, I've thought it was one, but it was the other. So as I've mentioned, I have this motto, when in doubt, run FileMon and RegMon. Always do a capture using both tools. In fact, there was a case, Mark, when you were coming to visit me, and I had been trying to get around a 30-day trial, which of course we would never recommend at home, 
And I was sure that the trial expiration date was in the registry, so I was doing a Regmon capture of this setup program that was failing because the 30-day trial had expired. Now, the reason I was doing this is that we had already purchased the license for this product, Mark. I just want you to know. That's what you led me to believe anyway. But the license had not arrived, so I felt in good conscience that I could uh, attempt to get around the 30-day trial limitation. Well, after pouring through the Regmon log, there was just no reference to anything remotely connected with a uh, in install date. And every attempt to install it said that we had exceeded the 30-day trial. You happened to arrive at that moment, and your first question was... You invited was, me over for dinner, if I recall. <laughs> That's true. There was an ulterior <laughs> motive. Uh, your first question to me was, well, did you run FileMon? And I went, oh, I forgot my own motto. In fact, actually, that's when the motto was invented. Right. So we ran FileMon. Sure enough, the setup program was opening a file in a hidden folder in the C program files directory, which was not deleted on the uninstall, because, of course, we had tried uninstalling this thing. And it was the creation date of that file that marked the original install. So deleted the folder, reinstalled the program, and it said, welcome to your 30-day trial of XYZ. Mm -hmm. So FileMon has Can you tell some, us the name of that program? I can't uh, reveal that now. So I ran into a situation where I ended up using not only FileMon and Regmon, but Process Explorer to troubleshoot a problem. On one of my computers, whenever I'd open certain folders in Explorer, Explorer's window would hang drawing for up to a minute at a time, and this was really annoying. Once it had drawn, then it would draw a few times, and then if I went to the folder again a few minutes later, we, I'd get that same hang again. This got really annoying, and I finally decided to try to troubleshoot it. So the first thing I did was to run Process Explorer. I ran Process Explorer, looked at the stack of Explorer thread that I knew was hanging, and saw this, a very big stack. Let me zoom in a little bit, and we can take a look at what's going on. So I see first he calls from the shell. Path is slow W, which is the third one up from the bottom there. What is there. shell 32.dll? Shell 32.dll is the main Explorer DLL. Provides most of the functionality of Explorer. So Explorer is actually a small stub relying a, a lot on this DLL and a couple of others to provide it what it does. Uh, path is slow called get path speed, which called in mpr.dll, which happens to be the multiple variety router, a component related to Windows networking called into the NT LAN man, again, no Windows networking, and you can see us going down to the kernel to a networking driver, mup.sys, which is the multiple, uh, the U UNC provider, which is also related to file and print paths, UNC paths. So I realized that this was, for some reason, Explorer was going off to some network shares somewhere and timing out probably after a minute before it would come back to me. So my first step then was to capture, or next step, was to capture a trace with FileMon, and this is what I saw. Explorer opening one of my other machines, development, the C share, which I'd create, so I create on my home systems to make it easy to access their different volumes, and getting back in there a bad network path. It only took me a second to realize that this machine was the machine that I de decommissioned just a few days earlier, which explained why I was getting uh, timeouts, why Explorer was getting timeouts trying to go to it. It simply wasn't there. Now, the next question I had remaining was, why was Explorer even trying to go to this machine in the first place? So I captured a Regmon trace to try to identify that reason. And this is the trace that I saw. Explorer querying a value under HK classes root paint shop pro 5 default icon and getting back a pointer to a path to paint shop pro on that development machine through the C share. PaintShop Pro is one of those programs that you don't really need to install, at least this older version of it, which I use. You can simply run it on one machine, uh, mount it from a network share, and run it on a different machine. But what happens the first time it runs is it does file associations for different types of format, graphical formats. And when Explorer opens up a folder with some of these file formats, it tries to go and find the icon it should be showing for these associations. In this case, it was going to get the association, the icon, from PaintShop Pro on the decommissioned computer, which is from where I'd run PaintShop Pro the first time I'd run it on this machine. And because it's decommissioned, it runs into the timeout, and the problem happens. So I solution to this was to go to the folder file association properties in Explorer and to uh, get rid of the file association. and. Uh, remove it so that now I was able to open those folders without any kind of delay. 
Now, Mark, this happens to be one troubleshooting scenario that you wrote up in detail on your blog. So you think it might be a good time to just bring up that blog entry to show people where that is because it's there for reference purposes. Um, sure. Let's go to the System Internals website. And I'm going to go to the Mark's blog. And here at the top, I have the full blog index. So I'm going to click on that and scroll down to... Well, you've been busy there, Mark. Yeah, lots of blog entries. You think anybody so, reads this stuff? I hope so. I hope I'm not speaking into the void. And there it is, Explorer's Registry pulling down, down. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's it. That's something different. Oh, that was another one. Yeah. That was a good one, though, too. Yeah, yeah that was. Uh, oh, there it is, the case of the intermittent yeah, Explorer hangs there it up is. towards the well, top. Intermittent and annoying, I'll point out, and uh, Explorer hangs. And there's the screenshot that we just looked at along with the traces that we just saw. So if you'd like to have a more detailed description of this and be able to see the steps that Mark went through, this is a blog entry. And this is, we should probably mention, one of several blog entries that are uh, records of some of the troubleshooting uh, steps that you've gone through using SysInternals tools. In this case, three of them, Process Explorer, Filemon, and Richmond. There are some situations where running file on a resume as you normally would simply won't capture the kind of activity that you're after. And one of the best examples of that is during the log off process or the logon process. Process uh, file on a resume running as normal applications will be terminated at the log off, so they won't be able to capture either of those activities. One of the ways that uh, you can configure Regmon and file on to capture activity during those situations is to simply put shortcuts in the startup menu for them, but that's not always sufficient to catch activity very early during the logon process. One way to configure Filemon and Regmon to remain running across the log off so that they continue to be running when you log on subsequently is to use psexec. Uh, in particular, to use psexec minus i uh, with minus s. Minus i gives the uh, psexec created process access to the interactive desktop. Minus s specifies to run it under the system account. That causes psexec to install a service so that it can create the child process under the system account because there's no way programmatically to create a process directly under those uh, particular built-in credentials. And it's because a service process and its children are not associated with the, the interactive logon session that means that when you log off, the file a regmon process launched by the psexec service will remain running because they're not considered part of the logon session and therefore they're not destroyed. Where do you get psexec, by the way? PSExec, from sysinternals, of course. Uh, by the way, psexec is, uh, in some circles, considered to be a virus. Yeah. Not because it's bad, but it's been used for evil. In fact, remember the story when I got the call from the bank in San Diego? Yeah. Uh, I get phone calls for sysinternals tools because Mark won't post his phone number on his website, but because he links to my website and I have a phone number, I get these crazy calls. I get a call from a lady who sounds in distress. She says, uh, is this sysinternals? I said, no, this is David Solomon, Expert Seminars. Well, how can I reach sysinternals? Well, they don't have a phone number because it's a freeware website. What's PSExec doing on my server? I said, well, calm down, ma'am. PSExec is a very useful tool that lets you launch processes on remote machines. And she said, well, what's PSExec doing on my server? She wanted to explain that she was managing servers for a bank, and this was one of their main servers in the Internet. And she said, somebody has a command prompt open running under the administrator account on my server using PSExec. And I said, well, ma'am, the only way somebody could do that is if they have the administrator password. She said, I don't understand. The administrator password is blank. She quickly That's frightening. realized that uh, that was not a good practice. And she hung up the phone, unfortunately, before I could find out what bank that was. Anyway, let's go and run psexec. So I'm going to a command prompt, and I'm going to run psexec minus s minus i, and I'm going to specify a local copy of Filemon I have in the C temp directory. This is important because if you do have Filemon a regimen on a network share, which of course is a violation of the sysinternals license unless you've licensed permission to do that, you'll need to make a local copy. And that's because the system account does not have access to the network. So Filemon starts up. One of the things we'll notice is that the font size is different than what we've seen in the rest of our presentation, and that's because this copy of Filemon is running under a different account, therefore it has a different user profile. Do you want to show them how we can see it's running in a different account? I guess we can run Process Explorer and take a look. So I'm bringing up Process Explorer scrolling down, and sure enough, there's the psexec service, which launched a copy of Filemon. And because we're running on 64-bit Windows, Filemon extracted a 64-bit version, created that as a child process, 
And if I double click on this process, we can see right on the uh, process properties, the username is running under the system account. Uh, key point is that if I log off now, these processes remain. And they would remain running across the next logon. And I've used this actually, Mark, to troubleshoot some spurious errors that occurred during a logon script. Ran FileMon and Regmon, and it was, if I remember correctly, a registry data mm -hmm. that was causing the logon script to fail. And the logon script would be launched before Explorer even launched, so you wouldn't be able to capture that by just simply putting FileMon in the startup folder. Right. But I noticed that you omitted the dash D switch when you typed in the command in the command prompt, which... That's true. If we go back to the command prompt, you can see I only specified minus S and minus I. Mm -hmm. And that's because uh, I forgot the minus D switch. Well, minus the, D would have not waited for right. the uh, So the service process. would have exited. We wouldn't have been able to see, though, the relationship between the PSExec service and right. the, the children. So it's kind of nice that you left it off. OK, thank you. Using PSExec uh, is a simple way to get FileMon and Regimon to survive a log off. But in some cases, you may need to have a registry or file trace of the startup of the system. And in that case, you need to configure FileMon and Regimon as a service to start at boot time. You can do that using the SRV Any service in the resource kit uh, that you can install twice, once to run Regmon and once to run FileMon. Make sure to specify interactive rights so you'll see the window. And then when the system boots, FileMon and Regmon will start up and you'll get a trace of the boot. Now, Regmon itself has a special option, which I'm going to demonstrate now, called the Log Boot option. So I'm going over to Regmon, and under the Options menu, there's an option to log the boot registry trace. If I select that, there's a message that comes up that says Regimon has been configured to log registry activity to a text file, regimon.log, during the next boot. So if I rebooted, all the registry activity would be logged to this log file, and it would continue logging to this log file until I ran Regimon again. Then it would start uh, stop logging to the text file and then sh uh, continue logging to the GUI. And it is amazing, Mark, to see the number of registry queries that occurred during the boot of the system.